trying to keep our ratios low, who's going in the room and out, out of the room. But if you, if you listen to their lungs, they're going to sound diminished. Maybe you'll hear some crackles. That's what you'd find on physical exam. So certainly in an awake patient, that is something you're going to want to be uh, tracking on. But just remember that every touch for any piece of equipment, you got to decon the heck out of that equipment. So we're actually discouraging, you know, our standard of care is frequent, frequent reassessments. That's not an option all the time for these patients. I, and I know that's, that's a hard pill to swallow for us who are used to doing that all the time. One of the other, but, but you, you still have to do it. So the answer is yes, we're still listening for lung sounds. Atelectasis usually results in diminished lung sounds because your alveoli have now collapsed, okay? And furthermore, not, don't have time to do it now, but another thing we're looking at is lung ultrasound. So getting a, an x-ray machine in there and then bringing it back out is huge because there's a ton of contamination on that machine that's possible. So what we're doing is handheld ultrasound, which is a whole other talk. By the way, guys, I've got an eight-hour ultrasound curriculum if you guys ever want it, made just for pre-hospital specialists, such as paramedics, like you guys. So if you ever want that, happy to do it, okay? But um, anyway, any other questions? Yeah, Doc, I have a question. Yeah. Oh. This is Wes. So the, uh, putting the patients prone, is that just for when they're under van, or can you pre-mature do that when they're still conscious and rest them in a uh, prone position? Yep. That was the question that one of your colleagues just asked, and I, and I think I got cut off. So you can. You can prone an awake patient on a nasal cannula. You can. What I was saying is uh, you just got to be really careful and uh, make sure you're monitoring them because when you flip them, they get they can get some redistribution of ventilation and oxygenation that could be problematic. Their stats could drop when you do it. They could improve because like I showed that CAT scan, all this stuff is layering in the back parts of their lung because they're laying flat and they can't move around a lot because they feel like crap. So they're laying in the bed, the fluids accumulating in the posterior and back parts of their lungs. So the idea is if you flip them, maybe we can start to improve their ventilation and perfusion a little bit more and bring their oxygen levels up. So it's absolutely something you could consider, but you just got to make sure you're monitoring them very carefully. Uh, of the two RSNAP protocols, do you prefer the high PEEP with uh, lower O2 or the lower PEEP with higher O2? I, I, I would say that um, I prefer the... Um, I, I, most of us prefer the low PEEP with the higher FIO2 for these patients. I say that though, uh, Dr. Gray, with very, uh, with hesitation because we're continuing to learn about these patients. I will tell you the answer is either one you pick, you're not going to be wrong. You just got to see um, how your patient does. What we're seeing with some of these patients though is it's really an oxygenation issue and that's because the lungs actually, I'm gonna show you a case in just a minute of a chest x-ray that's not that bad. The problem is <clears throat> those type two pneumocytes get attacked by the virus and then the surfactant's not made. And you might have an x-ray that doesn't look that bad, but they just need more oxygen because they don't have a good exchange across the alveolar capillary membrane. So I, I'm not trying to nerd out on you guys here, but it's a great question. Most intensivists, most intensivists buy the lower P, higher FIO2 strategy. As I say that, another paradigm in all of medicine is always to give less oxygen to our patients because it's very pro-inflammatory. So you got to pick a balance, but most, most of the evidence is probably the lower P is probably a little bit of a better strategy. But, you know, that's, that, that's, that's probably my, my shortest answer. I, could, I have some evidence in some other slide decks if you ever want that. I can, we can talk offline more. <clears throat> Any other questions before we get into troubleshooting? And in fact, as we get into this, guys, I know there's a lot of you, but I'm also I'm happy to be available if we want to do a FaceTime. If you're at an event, I'm going to be trapped in the hospital, okay? Um, we, I'm happy to be a consultant and uh, to look at your vent settings if you need that, if you're really out there. If you're really out there and you don't have any help, but you've got a good internet connection, that's another one. So I'll put that forward and do the best I can to support that. Um, but definitely we'll give you my email. It's at the very end. I am trying to give you guys general principles you can then apply to other things. That's, that's the goal with Doc Rush's getting involved with all this. Because I know you guys, you get this at the schoolhouse and then it's variable how many of you use it. You know, and like I know the Alaska unit, you guys do have some long transports. But that question, I, I will be honest, I probably need to table that a little bit. Um, 
I have some thoughts about it. I do. I have some very distinct thoughts. So your question is really getting at how do you differentiate different causes of respiratory failure and how to jump on that a little more quickly. The end, we're kind of working from the back though. We're working at, okay, we already know we need to take over their airway. We're putting them on a ventilator now. How do we manage the ventilator? That's kind of what this talk's been, this three-part series. I'll tell you what, let me, let me pause and just try to get, because we do, I do want to finish through the troubleshooting. I'm watching the clock and I know where we got into some questions, which is awesome. Um, this is all, by the way, very interactive for the next part. So uh, I think you guys will hopefully enjoy this and just being able to think it through. Okay. Is that okay? Let's try to knock, knock out a couple of cases. Before I do that, so I mentioned to you that the ventilator can be as much diagnostic as it can be therapeutic. Two things we can get off the ventilator, which you'll see on every ventilator, peak airway pressure and plateau pressure. Peak airway pressure, I want you to think about that as airways resistance. By the way, when I say airways, that's the right term. It's not airway resistance. The airways are all of the different branches in your lungs. So it's plural, airways resistance. So peak, ins peak airway pressure is a good indication. You'll see it on the vent. This is the, a good measure of just airways resistance, to keep it simple. Plateau pressure is something we have to do in, an intervention on the vent. So what you do is you stop the breath after end inspiration, and it gives you a pressure. This is how it works. You give the breath, then you press a button on the ventilator and say, okay, I'm not gonna let the patient exhale. You press that button, and then it reads out a pressure here. That is a good indication of what we were talking about before, compliance. Can the lung open and close easily, or is it as hard as a rock, okay? Peak airway pressure, airway resistance. Plateau pressure, compliance. Very simple way of thinking about this. I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying it, but this is practical stuff you can use. And how do we use that? Well, first of all, let me show you this video here. Can everybody see this? Okay, here is the LTV 1200. This demonstration is gonna show us how to check a plateau pressure. You gotta remember your plateau pressure on the ventilator is the second pressure that we're always gonna look at, but it's the most important pressure. The first pressure is your peak inspiratory pressure, and you can see that it's labeled here. Um, peak inspiratory pressure, peak airway pressure, same thing, okay? By the way, look at what he's got here. What's this number, guys? Can anyone see that? Can you, uh, can you see my pointer there? Respiration rate? Yeah, that's respiratory rate. What's this 500? What do you think that is? Um, tidal volume. Yep, you got it. What do you think this might be? 0.8. FiO2. Yep. So see how easy that is? The knobs are all here. This is a really good ventilator, by the way. I, you guys are probably be using this. Um, there's some more stuff here. We're not going to get into that. This is all hands-on stuff that you got to learn. I, I can preach. I can talk to him blue in the face, but... Okay, so there you go. And then here you see how it's in 22. So he does a really good job explaining this. Let's just you can continue the that video. By scrolling through our settings button or our, right here, or we can always identify that really, really quickly by this green bar that comes across. And so it's showing 22 centimeters of water. Remember your PIP is always going to be a second by second pressure that's given by the ventilator. Um, and it's not something we have to physically check to identify. The pressure we have to actually physically check is our plateau pressure. And I always kind of think of your PIP is based on, it's based on how quickly do we, we deliver our breath. The PIP is based on how much volume we're putting down those bronchioles, how quickly it's being put down, and our narrowing of those upper airways. And the ventilator will spit out that pressure. The plateau pressure is looking at lower lung compliance and it's looking at alveolar health. So your alveoli is where gas exchange happens, obviously. And so it'd be uh, important to always monitor how the pressures that are gonna be exerted against those alveoli. We know that air methods protocol and, and industry standard is that we want, never wanna exceed 30 centimeters of water on that pressure. And we need to take the steps to try to reduce that pressure um, as we've laid out in this presentation, if we are above 30 centimeters of water. So if we want to check this, again, our highest pressure is always our PIP. We can see it's at 22, 23, and our, our next pressure is going to be our plateau pressure. So we always want to monitor this 
if this ever spikes up, if it ever raises up suddenly, that should always be an indication that you should check our plateau pressure. So we're going to look at this. We place the patient on the ventilator. We're going to push this inspiratory, expiratory hold button. You can see inspiratory hold comes up. Now we're going to push it again, and we're going to hold this for a half second, and we're going to let this cycle through. It's going to show you static compliance. It's going to show you mean airway pressure, and it shows you I have a plateau pressure of 22. So we have a plateau pressure of 22. We have a PIP of 23, um, and we would just document that, and we would watch our patient. We have to remember that our patients, especially trauma patients that have been intubated, um, need to be monitored very, very closely for tension pneumothorax. Obviously, we're going to do a good assessment in the ambulance or in the hospital uh, prior to loading in the helicopter because we can't listen to lung sounds anymore. But your plateau pressure is going to give you a second-by-second -second accounting of if a simple pneumothorax is now progressing to a tension pneumothorax. So uh, what do you guys think? Did you, did you kind of get the concept of how he did that for plateau pressure? He hit that button. It kind of stopped the breath, and it was end inspiratory pause, and then it kind of stabilizes out and reads a pressure. This is something you got to practice, but do you get the concept a little bit of how that works? So you take a deep, deep breath. The plateau pressure is now we're, allowing, we're doing an end, end inspiratory pause, and we're kind of seeing where those lungs kind of equilibrate in terms of pressure. We don't want that to be above 30. Multiple studies have shown when it's above 30, you wind up getting a lot of inflammation. You're at risk to have a pneumothorax. Not good. It's just too much pressure in the system. 30, okay? So we always want to try to do things we can uh, to, to uh, attack that. So real quickly, I want to get to some cases, but this is out of the Marino book. I helped him write the small book, but uh, I get zero money for that, by the way. So it's kind of a rip off, thousands of hours of work for zero money, but it's still a good book. But respiratory deterioration, the first thing to look at is your peak airway pressure. So you've got a patient you're being called to, the ventilator's going off, blah, blah, blah. All right, we need someone to take a look at this. Their SAT's going down, their peak airway pressure's going up. Well, if it's just the peak airway pressure, then Think about an airway obstruction. Think about bronchospasm. Think about things that cause airway resistance issues, okay? That's what I want you to think about. Um, some, most often it's an obstruction, some secretions. They might need to be suctioned. Maybe they need a neb. But if it's just the peak airway pressure that's high, think airways obstruction. Now, your peak airway pressure is high. You check a plateau pressure. The plateau pressure is also high. The number to remember is 30. Your plateau pressure is above 30. Now you've got to think about some of the stuff that he just alluded to. Pneumothorax, atelectasis, maybe their abdomen's really distended. These are all things that can stop your compliance from being normal or to be increased, so, or decreased rather. So your lungs are less compliant. So the ventilator has to work harder to open those lungs. So this is a real quick, easy to learn algorithm for troubleshooting ventilator pressures. Peak pressure, plateau pressure. To illustrate, and also don't forget, dope. You guys have all learned this. I know you know this very well. Um, run this mnemonic through. I do this every time I'm called for a problem. That's the first thing I do. Are we dislodged? Do we have an obstruction? Is there a pneumo? Is there any equipment issues? All the time. So I think you guys know that. Uh, let's go through a couple cases. I'm watching the clock, and I know we're about running out of time here. I'm not going to rush this. We can always come back next week and do more, but I do want to show you how this all comes together with a couple cases, uh, and I think you'll feel better about all of this because you'll see how it comes together. So let's start. These, by the way, are all cases we're treating right now at Shock Trauma Center in our biocontainment unit, our BCU. Used to be called our lung rescue unit. Two weeks ago, we renamed it biocontainment unit. So we got 32 beds that are in negative pressure. Some of those patients are on ECMO. That's, wh that's where these cases are coming from. So here's one, 65-year-old woman, COVID positive. She's got pneumonia, intubated, high airway pressures, high airway pressures. So how would you react to that? How are you going to evaluate the patient? How would you approach this patient? The nurse is coming to grab you. Hey, the, the, the airway pressures are high. Can you help me? Thoughts, guys? What do you think? How would you, how, what would be your approach? 
I think you just saw the algorithm, right? I mean, I might be totally off on this, but first you have to look at obstructions. I mean, honestly, this could be a quick fix a lot of times. Maybe there's just some crap in the ET tube. Maybe they need to be suctioned. Maybe the tube is kinked. Um, I had a case a couple weeks ago. They called me emergently, and they were freaking out. And it was all, all it was is the tube was just flexed over. I mean, they did all, they, all we had to do to fix it was that. Thank God. They were calling me to reintubate the patient. I, and I was like, wait a minute, guys. The tube is just kinked. No problem. I was happy. Done. Maybe bronchospasm. I will tell you, most of these patients probably won't have a lot of bronchospasm. That's not something we see all the time in ARDS. You can see it. Um, but really, what I would ask you to think about is work either from the machine to the patient, or, or as we do, work from the patient back to the ventilator, okay? Patient back to the ventilator. So this is where you do have to listen to lung sounds. Using lung ultrasound. Check for equal chest rise. Okay, I don't hear any wheezing. You're working your way up now to the ET tube. Is there an obstruction? Are there secretions? What are we dealing with there? Is the tube kinked? Is the tube out of the patient's trachea? Are they extubated? Okay, next, work your way to the circuit. Is there anything kinking the circuit? And then finally, is the ventilator working properly? Is the power on? Is it plugged in? Is our oxygen supply plugged in? So work from the patient back to the ventilator. I do this all the time in the OR and in the ICU. So if I'm tasked with the problem, I just be, I'm systematic. All right, guys, let's go from patient back to the ventilator. That's how I do it, okay? And keep in mind with increased, increased airway pressure, as you mentioned, you know, it's gonna be some kind of either obstruction, maybe they're main stemmed, maybe they just got prone and now we flipped them and the ET tube got jammed in a little further, and now they're a main stem intubation, so it's only in their right side of their lung, their left side's getting no aeration at all. That can cause increased airway pressures. If they're getting worse, they're getting more pulmonary edema, that can do it. And then finally, if they're not sedated enough, this can happen, okay? That's another problem. And think about, now what if we had high plateau pressure with this patient? This is stuff that can cause that. So progression of ARDS, we see this a lot with surgical patients that have abdominal compartment syndrome. That's a syndrome where their belly gets really big and it cuts off into their chest and it impacts their lungs. So not good. What if they have chest wall rigidity? Bonus question, when, when could you get your chest wall rigidity? You guys ever talk about this? Uh, burn patients, circumferential burn, burn. Ah, good, yes, yes, that, there you go, sure. That's gonna cause an external problem with lung compliance because the chest wall is not compliant. That's an outstanding answer. The other one you might see, which I will tell you, I've been doing this over 20 years, I've seen maybe one case of it, is if you give a whopping dose of fentanyl, it's described you could get chest wall rigidity. I, I gotta be honest, I just don't see that, and I give, I've given really high doses, especially in trauma, of fentanyl, but it's described. So if you're giving a bolus of fentanyl, and all of a sudden you see the plateau pressure, go up, that could be something. The more common things are going to be this, though. Your ARDS is going to be poor, uh, progressing, and you could wind up with that. Let's jump to another case. Here's one. So 63-year-old guy, diabetes, hypertension, COVID positive, mechanical ventilation. You're called because he's got gurgling noises from his mouth. You take a look at the ventilator. Your tidal volume you dialed in was 450, but when you look on the ventilator, it says, the exhaled tidal volume, which is a separate column, you'll see 300 mils. So what you're giving the patient, you're not getting back. And there's gurgling. So what do you guys think could be going on here? Thoughts? Obstruction. Edema. Could, could be obstruction. Could be, definitely could be edema. Could Would be you expect? Like, uh, I think the cuff broke. Ah, yes. Would you expect to hear gurgling noises if the ET tube is right in the right spot and properly inflated? That's not something we normally hear, right? So who said that? Someone said, uh, check the cuff. Yeah, maybe the cuff, maybe the cuff's down, maybe the cuff's ruptured. Well, what, about, um, what about checking to see the tube? Is the tube in the right place? So for this case, I will tell you with these COVID patients, do you guys use a lot of video laryngoscopy? Glidescope, Ranger, do you guys use those in your practice? We got them in Alaska. You have in Alaska, okay. Yeah, so I mean, we would highly, we would highly recommend using these uh, video laryngoscopes. And the reason for it 
is because you're not as far in looking at the patient. You can give yourself a little distance and it gives you a really good field of view. So for this patient, all we had to do was put the tube in a little more. This was a supraglottic, in other words, basically an extubation. The patient, um, the airway pressures were increasing because the lungs are getting really bad. And we had to go back in and push, push, push the tube in, deflate the cuff, push the tube in, reinflate the cuff. That's all we had to do. They were calling us though for a reintubation. You didn't need to reintubate this patient. It was just a matter of getting the tube back in the right spot. Does that make sense? You guys see how this works a little bit? I mean, again, you work back from the patient to the ventilator. We had low tidal volumes. We didn't see a lot of chest rise. I'll be honest, I didn't listen to the lungs. I went right for video laryngoscopy, and that's how we managed this. Here we are with a patient who's COVID pneumonia, 58 years old. She arrested actually before intubation. We got her in the vent, and actually this is the second day on mechanical ventilation. We get called because this is going on. We see a lot of irregular breathing. And when we walk in the room, the respiratory rate's really high. Any thoughts about what could be going on here? Can you, uh, can you just paralyze her? I mean, she's potentially. Ah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, right. I mean, this is chaos, right? This is, this is vent desynchrony. This is not, remember those waveforms I showed you guys in the last couple talks, those nice waveforms, nice and regular. This is not regular. This is complete chaos. So it doesn't even matter what this waveform is. You don't have to analyze. This isn't a, something you're going to answer on an exam. It's complete chaos. And when you go in the room, you see that because the patient is awake and just needed to be sedated. So yes, you could paralyze the patient. If you have the ability to provide some sedation first, I would do that. But if they're desatting with this, paralyzing them is not the wrong answer. Just remember, you want to sedate them too as well because you know it's poor practice to paralyze without sedation, but, but that is an emergency critical action procedure is you've got to take over the situation and get back on track. Because if this goes crazy, the patient will just start desatur desaturating. They can actually code. This is a pre-code situation if you don't regulate your mechanical ventilation. All right, here's one other one, and maybe we'll stop after this one. I, I know we're getting long in this here. 36 years old, COVID positive, Get this, this is a patient who had the HELP syndrome. I'm not gonna get into that, but she was pregnant and she needed to deliver. Fortunately, the baby was there long enough. So we delivered the baby, C-section at the bedside, went well, baby's okay. Um, Post-op, close her up, all this was done at the bedside, close her up, she gets her you know, back on the ventilator the whole time. And then she starts doing this. She starts breathing really fast, 42 times a minute in fact. And this is what the ventilator waveform looks like. Now, again, I don't expect you guys to know vent waveforms, but to really simplify this, liters per minute, so that's flow of how much is going through the circuit, and this is your waveform. And take a look at this here, what's going on? You see that subtlety there? What, what can happen if you're breathing really fast on a mechanical ventilation? You can start stacking breaths. You start to see it here, it's subtle, but this, you wind up breath, 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 and there's no time to exhale. So you stack the breaths on top, the thorax gets completely filled with air, you close off your inferior vena cava, the blood supply coming back to the, the heart gets cut off, and they can code. How do you treat this? I programmed uh, 15 on the ventilator, but she's breathing 42 times a minute. Just paralyze her. <laughs> I like the way you guys think. You guys think like an anesthesiologist. Yeah. The heck with this. Let's just paralyze the patient. We'll take control. That is what you have to do. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to laugh. I'm not making fun of you. You're, the answer is actually correct. Again, always try to get the sedation in there. But the immediate thing is, yeah, just paralyze them. This is a patient who gets rockeronium or becaronium. That's fine. The other thing with this is if you're truly breath stacking, you, you mentioned you got to give them time to exhale. Somebody mentioned that, right? One of the things you might have to do, and I know this goes against all of our COVID stuff, is you may need to temporarily remove them from the ventilator, okay? And allow them to exhale quickly and then get them back on. Just keep in mind, if you do that, you're going to see a lot of aerosolization. So what we would recommend is putting a bag over the patient or something to contain that, and then you go in with your arms with full PPE, disconnect, and reconnect. 
Hopefully you can get away with this by monitoring the patient and not letting them get this to Kipnik. So better sedation is almost always the problem. This patient was too awake. She was not sedated properly. That's the problem. We didn't have enough sedation on her. Uh, and that's why she did this. And she's young. So patients are going to do this when they're on the ventilator. They don't, nobody wants to be on a ventilator being told when they're going to breathe. She was starting to wake up. Got, it was actually getting a little better. So that's what we did. We just we were able to get away with sedation, but those are all interventions for this. All right, guys, we're running out of time. I got, I got uh, another case here, but let me jump to this. Um, I will send out a... I will try to send these links to you because I get a lot, asked a lot of questions about this. First of all, I really like the MCRIT book on this. It's been updated every couple of days. I think it's one of the best sources of information out there. So here's the link to it. Um, Doc Rush, I can send you these links and maybe you can distribute them because uh, I don't want to waste more time having everyone try to copy down these long uh, URLs. There's also a thing we have on the Society of Critical Care Medicine in a complete um, lecture series that we've released. Uh, that you can also look at, which talks about a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, okay? Uh, so mechanical ventilation, good review. Each lecture is like eight to 20 minutes, so they're short and sweet. And last, we have a bunch of checklists here that you can go through, PDFs, and just general critical care knowledge if you want to take this with you into the place where you're going to be working. So we created a bunch of this stuff in the last week that I want to make available. Again, I'll give you these links. Um,